Hi, and welcome to The Queer Creative. I'm Renessa. And I'm Jonah. And I plucked a white eyebrow hair out of my face <laughs> this morning. So I hate those. Also, yeah. white nose hairs. Oh, I haven't had <laughs> one of those yet. <laughs> They're coming. Oh, my God. How's uh, your week? It's good. I, I, uh, I've been struggling with, like, getting a little bit sick the last few weeks. I had a lovely stomach bug that was just <laughs> awful. Um, however, at the end of it, I felt like I went on like a fabulous cleanse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always great about getting diarrhea. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the five pounds I, like, I lose. I feel so clear headed. and. <laughs> oh, uh, really? Clear headed? Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, that's good. Um, You're probably starving. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go through it again anytime soon. But um, yeah, so I was like in New Hampshire with my mom and she was taking care of me for that. Um, and it was like a couple of days of, of that. And so I didn't want to put anything into my, I didn't want to take any like of my, you know, prescriptions or vitamins or anything like that. So I just didn't take my antidepressants for two days. And oh, that was stupid. Yeah, that was, um, you can't do that. That started to get rough. Uh, so all better now. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're better. That can be dangerous. You should never do that. Yeah, well, Always I thought those, that, like, I was told that, you know, a couple of days it would, but yeah, it was, it was definitely starting to, I was starting to lose it. <laughs> Welcome to the Queer Creative. Mm -hmm. This is a um, great conversation. For but I've been, be into, <laughs> I've been getting back into, I've been getting back into, to fitness this year i've made it past the the january 18th um you know deadline that people start dropping off of like weight watchers and stuff so oh, yeah. i um i've been getting into like doing a boot camp with my friend jen and going back to my local yoga studio that i used to go to a lot and last night i was at the queerest yoga class that quincy massachusetts has ever seen i'm pretty sure I, the teacher named Ebony, um, she was so lovely. I can't wait to go back next Saturday. If you're in Quincy, Massachusetts, come to her 430 vinyasa class next Saturday. I will definitely be there. Where, what um, studio? Healing Tree Yoga. It's my little neighborhood yoga studio. And so she had, she had a t-shirt on that had this quote on it that I will read to you. And then I went home and like Googled it, to, which says to be visibly queer is to choose your happiness over your safety. And that's by Deshaun Harrison. So I Googled Deshaun Harrison and he is a queer writer in, I think he's down South. So he has some really interesting blog posts on his website, DeshaunHarrison.com. So I'll have to reach out to him. So yeah, and the class was definitely like the queers were there. There's definitely like a few, a few gays. Nice. Um, yeah. How I have you been? Back into yoga. Yeah. Fine. I'm, I'm getting, I'm coming down with the cold. Yeah, but you, went, your mom was in town, and Theron's mom was in town last yeah, week so or something. Yeah. So we took our mothers to go to the uh, Oprah 2020 Vision tour. Oh my God. With Michelle Obama. Did they was, cry? Was it like nobody moving? Cried. It was really? moving. I mean, Michelle Obama was the highlight. Uh, the rest of it is just the stuff that Oprah and WW um, put out. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, wellness and happiness and joy and that sort oh, of thing. Amazing. <laughs> Have you seen <laughs> Oprah I, I don't, before? I don't buy into any of it. Yeah. It doesn't Instead. speak to me. That sort of <laughs> You're like, this is bullshit. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not like that. I used to be like that. Now I realize like there's a lot of people that it actually does uh, help. And yeah. Interesting enough, like my boyfriend is a little bit, uh, he leans more towards that sort of, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. That, yeah. Would that be a Inspirational, theory? Inspirational, like, yeah, he's yeah. motivational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But for me, this sort of like esoteric, I need something tangible. I can't be like, oh, the spiritual like journey that I'm on or, know. you know, uh, I, I know you can't, it just, unless it's I'm not, mushroom induced. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Michelle Obama, uh, she yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. She was great. She's the, one of the sharpest women and uh, very intelligent and sort of um, powerful in the way that mm -hmm. she speaks, mm -hmm. almost as good an orator as uh, Oba uh, as uh, Barack. Almost. Um, almost. 
Almost. Is that because, because she's, she's a woman? Oh, no, because she's, she had, no. Because she's and not she, a professional politician. Yes. Not even that. Not even that. It's that she's naturally more funny. So, yeah. I, res- I, to me, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like, it gets more distracting because I enjoy funny. So I'm like more into that, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm not, probably not making any sense. Yeah. Here, <sighs> That's amazing, though. So, what, any good takeaways from that? I don't even really remember it. <laughs> 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 you were there. It happened. I was there. I got my picture of Michelle Obama and I left. You got a picture of her, not with her. Okay. Yeah. 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 Of her. Yeah. Oh, man. No, it was fun. It was enjoyable. We learned a lot. We did this. Oh, here's an interesting thing. They give you all a, um, a workbook that you're going to laugh at this a workbook. And mm-hmm. it's like you measure these, um, you know, it's sort of like, how you deal with stress and mm-hmm. and sort of how you live your life and how much of a positive person you are and blah blah blah. I'm rolling my eyes as I'm as I'm doing it, right? So it goes Darren, me, my mother, and then Darren's mother <clears throat> are all li- like sitting side by side. Mm-hmm. So I'm up beside my mother, so I'm filling it out, and my mother is loving every minute of it, right? She's also like very much like Darren and. and Leads yes, in Oprah and, he and her mission. So, sweet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so anyway, we're we're filling out this workbook, and at the end of it, I was like, "Oh, this is garbage," because I got such a low grade, which said stuff like, "You know, I got like a ninety-eight, and Darren was like, "Oh, I got a one twenty-eight," and then my mother was like, "Shut up, I got a one twenty-eight," and then <laughs> Darren's mother says, "Oh, I got a ninety-eight," and I'm like, "Wait." <laughs> so we're basically in a relationship with our mother right yeah <laughs> each of our opposite mothers yeah 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 that's so anyway. funny yeah so that's pretty much uh the highlight of my week <laughs> so real quick i want to congratulate um our winners of the uh shaquanda will feed you hot sauce contest yeah we had, <laughs> we had a we had previous a guest we had andre springer uh shaquanda from Shaquanda will feed you as our previous guest, uh, like two episodes ago. And um, we had him sign four bottles of hot sauce. Uh, Different and the winners, flavors. Yes, no, yes. And uh, the winners were Brian Griffin at Brian Griffin, Amanda Wand at Mando and the World, Elizabeth at Elizabeth and Colette Rivera at ColRiv84. I will put all of these in our show notes if you- Sure. Congrats, guys. I want pictures of this hot sauce and I want to be tagged and I want you to tag the brand and I want some appreciation. <laughs> Jonah's schlepping to the post office. Also, <laughs> these people all gave their address to us very free. Like, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this after and I was laying there and I was like, Oh, these people are lit. I could be a serial killer and I'm going to go show up their house and they would, they, you know, they're giving me their address. You very well scary? could be a serial killer. Um, but I mean, we're a legitimate podcast, kind of, sort of. <laughs> I guess. Do we look like, don't we look Maybe. like you could I mean, trust we don't have us? a blue check. We don't have a blue check, so. <laughs> That's true. Nobody no takes us serious. <laughs> right. Anyway. Great. Congrats, guys. Yeah. And now for Queer News and Culture. <clears throat> queer News and Culture. So it's Black History Month, and I have a couple of things to share. Um, one is this, I mean, I've been reading this um, Queer X design book, and Jonah, you actually have a, a copy of this, and you- No, Renessa, I gave it to you as a gift, and you left it at my house, forgot that I gave I it know, to you, and, and bought then, your own copy. Yes, that's what happened. <laughs> yep. So thank you, Jonah. <laughs> You're um, so this book is awesome. Um, I obviously am um, a designer, and I do a lot of brand identity, so I've just been kind of, you know- perusing this book, um, but it basically covers from like the 60s onward, everything from like the pink triangle to um, to the Ellen logo. And there was a quote in here that I wanted to read from the Black Lives Matter um, visual identity, um, which was, you know, started by Alicia Garza, Patrice Coulors, and Opal Tometi. Um, two of whom self-identify as queer. Um, so 
It is an image of intersectional movement building, an act of protest and regeneration in the face of systemic police violence against Black people. It is incumbent upon LGBTQ people of all racial and ethnic identifications who have historically protest pro police brutality within their communities to join Black communities in affirming the significance and mattering of Black lives. And there's also the um, Association of Black Gays logo that they talk about in here. Um, which was formed in the 70s as a Los Angeles, a Los Angeles um, queer group. So and it looks very 70s. Right. And also, I, I want to address the um, 1619 Project. Yeah, I have that here as well. Jonah sent me a copy, which was extremely thoughtful and... Jonah, how did you come across it? I mean, it, it's from it's a New York Times magazine project, so. Right, it's a New York Times, it's called the 1619 Project, um, and it was developed, I, I believe it began, I don't know if it was 2018, but it may have been 2019, end of 2018, anyway. Mm -hmm. It's to um, sort of, it's timed right for the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first Africans in Virginia. In 1619, yeah. Yeah, as slaves, um, so it's sort of, it's giving, it's re-examining the legacy mm -hmm. of slavery in the United States and sort of um, telling stories that I had never heard in, yeah. in my history class. Most of us Americans have never Absolutely. heard, uh, including right. African-Americans. Yep. Um, and there are incredibly important history and uh, stories to be told there. So I just, I really believe that this was a wonderful project. So I Got, yeah. um, got us all some copies, but yeah, I'll read yeah. one quote by Nicole Hannah Jones. Our founding ideals of liberty and equality were false when they were written. Black Americans fought to make them true. Without this struggle, America would have no democracy at all. Um, yeah. yeah. So check this out. I don't know if you can still get like you can copies of it, but yeah. Yeah, you can get um, reprints of it on uh just google it 1619 project from the new york times magazine um and i believe they're inexpensive they're only like six dollars mm -hmm. um so yeah so this week we were also introduced to Dwayne wade's um daughter zaya mm -hmm. who is also gabrielle union um union's stepmother yeah or stepdaughter Step <laughs> <laughs> um what which was very family. sweet and yeah, no, they all seem very well adjusted. Uh, it's sort of wonderful yeah. humans. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I was thinking about this story, people are probably familiar with who Z Zaya is at this point, but mm -hmm. what really struck me about this was that it made me so happy for the family. And I immediately went on social media and I was like applauding the father for being such a great father. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's like, and then I was reading an article that he did where he was like, it makes me uncomfortable that people re are rewarding me for the basic, right. For the basic part of being a father, which is to show love to your child. Um, ah. And I, yeah, I know. I was like, my God, this man is so one, like he just wonderful humans. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. humans. Yes. Um, Zaya is a 12 year old. Um, we came out as trans, uh, excuse me, transgender uh, live on, on I don't know what social media platform it was, but it was one. Oh, on like a video. On a video, yeah. Oh, okay. She's driving a like golf cart, and she's just talking about. Um, <laughs> oh, actually, I have two quotes here. That, I love that. Uh, in the video, she's like, "He's like, you know, is there something you want to the world to know, or whatever?" And he, she's like, "Yes, be true, and don't really care what the stereotypical way of being you is." And then she goes on to say, "I know it can get tough, definitely, but I think you push through, and you be the best you." Which I just thought was lovely. Oh my God. Um, shout out to that entire family, uh, especially Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union, just for being so thoughtful um, and putting their f their own family sort of um, happiness know, happiness for the world to see. Because it's important that also like somebody that's in the spotlight like that, mm -hmm. just sh like, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, we all know what you're trying to say. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so I, I don't like usually watch SNL. I, you don't watch SNL when it's on on Saturday nights either. You watch it on Sunday morning. So 
you were absolutely raving about RuPaul's performance um, a couple weekends ago. And I, I've watched all of the, the sketch clips on YouTube since let's discuss. Cause I think, she what'd did. you think? I thought she did a great job. I thought she did a great job. Um, yeah. and I totally see what you were saying about how they obviously like, I mean, that, that's what they do, right? They, they, they cater the writing to the, to the, the guests. specific guests. So I thought it was a great opportunity to see, to let RuPaul sort of shine. Um, he, we forget that he is a creative person with multiple talents, you know, yeah. cause it's sort of just, I mean, I guess we don't forget, but. Well, he's got his show you know now I mean. too. He's doing more um, acting. actual acting. Yeah. Right. And I think he's doing a good job. I think he did well in the sketch comedy acts. Uh, it's live television, so that's a big risk. Yeah, uh, yeah. I really loved um, the library sketch. Let's play a clip of that here. <laughs> the library is open. <laughs> okay. First up, Eloise by Kay Thompson. Eloise, you need to call the front desk and get a hot oil cheaper for that broom on your head. <laughs> and girl, Victoria's Secret call, they want their wallpaper back. <laughs> and what is she doing? Popping a fart? <laughs> Got that leg all cranked out, all nasty. Girl, please. <laughs> That was great. Um, yeah. I, you know, I had no idea that these drag story times were even going on until you mentioned it to me. Um, and my sister actually is sent me a Facebook event for one that's happening in Boston next weekend. Um, she wants to bring my nephew. So, yeah, this is a lot longer discussion, I think. Yeah. But when I first heard about those, I was like, oh, that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Like, because so we grew up, you and I grew up in the nightclubs where drag was predominantly, you know, that's where drag was when Yeah, we were it was like a seedy underworld thing. Right. And now, right. and now it's become mainstream and probably a right. bunch of like yuppie moms are going to bring. Well, not even that, but like but, there are even drag queens that are, are like PG, you know, that like yeah, just I stick to the like theater to of look it. at them. So like yeah, Claire. we'll talk more about it if uh yeah, if I go to that next weekend I'll definitely Yeah, no, definitely. Photos. Let's talk about that next week. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that the song Yummy, Justin Biebs, the Biebs killed it on the Why? show too. Because the song Yummy is like, it's my fucking 2020 anthem. I'm so obsessed it? with it. It's such a simple, basic pop song that he probably took five minutes to write. Um, but yeah. Are you oh, a Justin? Anyway. Bieber? No, I never really was, but like I, you know what? We, we're all hot messes at some point in our lives, and he did that, and he's, and he's back with, with an anthem, and I mean you, that was I that was the only song I liked on the on SNL. Um, this is gonna be like sexist of me, but for some reason, for like men that have come up as a, as young people and then i have yeah. zero interest in that right like, like so justin bieber i can't no. i just can't take him seriously at all i mean i can take him seriously i i just the, he's it's just not, not on my radar There's nothing serious about it right but if it was a woman <laughs> and i watched her from like a child like um for an example miley cyrus who i love yeah. i mean i can watch her be sexual and like get really into it yeah but with justin bieber for some reason my with men if they were young and oh, popular yeah. i don't know it's weird maybe it's your i don't gay, know if it's tied to like a sex gayness. thing and i'm just not a pedophile right that's good <laughs> <laughs> okay that's all i got yeah that's all for <laughs> queer news and culture today so we have quite the interview coming up for you today. <laughs> Our guest is Roger Q. Mason, mm -hmm. who identifies as a Black, Irish, Filipino, queer, gender nonconforming writer and performer, director and producer. His work has been shown at theaters like the New York Theater Workshop, New Group Theater, Ensemble Studio Theater, Chicago Dramatists, many more. Yeah, you guys are in for... Uh a ride. You're in for a treat. You're in for quite, get ready. 
<laughs> Buckle up. Oh, Roger's uh, very charismatic. He's definitely a playwright and storyteller. You can tell yes. uh, right off the bat. Yeah. She goes on and on and on. And in the best, in the best way. Like. Oh, I fell in love with him. The gift of words and really paints a picture. Yeah. Of. Like, yeah, I think I mentioned it's mm-hmm. like sitting around a campfire and just letting listening to this man talk. Yeah. Um, he is very like poetic and almost like rhythmic in the way that he tells stories and the way that he weaves one story seamlessly into the next was like, I mean, I, you know, you just like want to keep listening. Um, (laughs) He's very talented and I'm looking forward to uh, people hearing his, his, his rant. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there was one point where like, you know, you guys, you just go and tell a story talking about like his, you know, his lineage and his background and how that influences work. And I left the room, went and changed my tampoon, fed my cat, came back (laughs) and he was, (laughs) hadn't stopped. Um, Tampoon. I like that. Tampoon. (laughs) Just a beautiful (laughs) voice to listen to. He does have a beautiful voice. I love listening to the stories about his family. Yeah. His family, he has a very interesting family with a lot of history um, in Los mm-hmm. Angeles. Yeah. And um, that was a big highlight for me. I just liked hearing his sort of lineage and how he um, pulled creative inspiration from them and mm-hmm. sort of learned his gift of gab. Yeah. And since our interview, he has won the 2020 Chuck Rowland Pioneer Award, which is a Celebration Theater and the City of West Hollywood um, Award, recognizing contributions to LGBTQ playwriting. Previous honorees have included Billy Porter from Pose. So that is amazing. Yeah, congratulations, Congrats, Roger. Roger. <laughs> he has upcoming projects, uh, Pleasure Men, which will be in L.A. sometime this summer. Um, yeah. Um, and Lavender Men is another one that's coming out this spring at the Los Angeles Skylight Theater. So we'll also put the link to that in the show notes. Yeah, this man is full of love and positivity, and I really enjoyed him, and I know you will um, as well. So buckle up because you're in for a ride. Buckle up. Enjoy. Without, yes, here's Roger Q. Mason. Yeah, that's How what are y'all you? gonna get. Okay, good. We hit record. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you yeah. see, that was my record face. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh Lord, I I didn't know this was gonna be. Uh, I didn't know this was going to be on um, video, but I yeah, I guess that's that's cute. I, you all can see I, I was I'm trying for those that have been following these because I, I I'm blessed enough to have enough interest in the world in my little engine that could that uh, I've gotten a few of these podcasts under my belt so y'all love it follow me we'll see that I, I've got the little five o'clock shadow thing I'm in a play um here in Los Angeles it's a um it's it's the Nutcracker, but it's an immersive cocktail fit, they call it. Oh, does it have wow. like a, a different name than the Nutcracker? I know that here they have like um, Slut Cracker. No, this like, is they still, they're still cracking nuts in this one. It's still oh. the Nutcracker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one is still the Nutcracker. Do, now, who you all are both from New York or? or... I, so I live in New York and Renessa's in Boston. Yeah. Okay, got it. Well, then maybe Jonah, you know about this company. It's uh, it's called Fever Originals. I've heard of it. So they are by Coastal. They're actually an international company. Um, so I am in their Los Angeles production of um, of this of this Nutcracker, and then they have another one going up in New York. Oh, that's so exciting. cool. Yeah, so I'm doing the LA. So because I'm playing all these different characters and stuff, I thought I was going to try this little butch, little five o'clock shadow thing. I'm done with it, baby. I'm cutting it <laughs> off. I'm I'm going to look like a cherub and queen for this show. I'm going to beat this face, but you all are getting it. So for those of the, so for people that are watching this, this is probably the only time you will see this facial hair, which is interesting because. I think this is a place to get into 
as she sips her, um, yes, queer creative, there you go. Which is interesting to me because I think there's a point to be made with this five o'clock shadow. So I have been misgendered, I'll call it, many times. I have come into places with this, this much facial hair before. And I'm still Madam, Miss, Ma'am, She. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are your it, pronouns? It, so I go by he, him, his, but okay. I do that under protest because I think we need to redefine what that set of pronouns can hold. Okay. And, and if it can hold, if it can hold a, a, a queen like me, then I think we've done some work. Yes. You know? Because if it's if it's a big you. enough tent, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's very so. But I, I it's you know what they they used to say, use it, darling. So I'm here with this five o'clock shadow because I didn't know we, it was going to be videoed. So we're going to use it. This yes. is a scene of instruction. I could literally be on the phone or uh, in person at, or in a cab. I'll have this much facial hair. Y'all can see it. Okay, you saw it. It's done. And they will still think that my essence is female, not just feminine, but female. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting to me to think about what is it that we have been socially conditioned to read and register as female, feminine, feminized, mm -hmm. sissy, all of these different, what, what, are, what, is, what makes something of one or the other or somewhere in the middle. Because obviously, from an optical standpoint, right now you would register me as masculinized. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But then once I open my damn mouth, now all of a sudden folks are confused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know if you've ever really stood and listened to how people try and navigate their understandings of gender. But all of a sudden they become very inarticulate and mm -hmm. their diction and their diction is almost elementary. It's almost as if they are, they have reverted to an eight to 10 to maybe at most 12 year old self. And yeah, it's, so you mean like when they are trying to be, they're trying to act sensitive around what to refer to someone as, but then they start tripping over their, their words? I think that's right. I, yeah. That's part of it. Or when they're trying to explain to you why they think you're one thing or the other. And they're like, mm. but, but your hair, but, but, you just, but, you, but you just are, you just are that way. And all of a sudden it's this very... This person could be the most eloquent and interesting, you know, a, a user of the, uh, of the English language. But all of a sudden, when you get back to that place, it takes people back to, I think, a formative moment. The moment when they were somewhere between 8 and 10 and 12, and these ideals were codified. Yeah. Yeah. And it's relatively and they never new grew, that people are and trying. They never, yeah. They never grew past that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I sit here and say he, him, his, but I'm uh, doing it under protest because I'm trying to um, expand what that term can hold, I'm saying I have to take these children back to school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm saying we have reopened the library and it's yes. time for everybody to start reading because what did that sister say on, on Paris is burning? Reading is fundamental. fundamental. <laughs> so that's where we are with that. I mean, that's really where we are. So I have this intro that I'm going to do, but I'm, I'm thinking let's just keep going because let's record it and we'll add it in after. You can add but it in later. I was listening. This is a good just segue because I was listening in. to a podcast that you were a guest on, The Subtext. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, uh -huh. Yes. Which you were talking about. You had this fascinating lineage of amazing female role models. Um, yes. You know, can you talk about a little about that? Because I loved listening to your mother, about your mother, your grandmother, how you lived in Koreatown. L.A. Oh, my good. Oh, Lord. I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if I can recreate that with the same because you have to understand we were sitting. Uh, it was me and Brian Pollock mm -hmm. and we were at the public theater in the library upstairs 
and every five minutes there was uh there was a, a, an alarm that would go off warning uh <laughs> that the show was about to start and so there was just a there's just a natural um you know a a, a a a a chemistry in that in that particular room that fed into that interpretation of the story but uh, i can i can recount some of it so i am black irish and filipino born and raised well actually born in santa monica i'll i'll give you all a little a little bit that I, i've been thinking about since that interview i was born in santa monica california and raised in koreatown now i want to talk a little bit about the Santa Monica aspect of it because there's a story to be told there and I can't recall if I did this on that other podcast or not but when i say that i was born in Santa Monica that's also a form of protest because Los Angeles is very segregated not only financially and um geographically but also racially mm -hmm. and when i was growing up in the 80s and 90s there was a certain part of town where this group could, had per permission to be and this group had permission to be in another part. It's essentially part of what led to the LA riots mm -hmm. was the idea that there was, there's this cultural eligibility for people to be in certain places and not elsewhere. So the connotation of being from or born within or having some affiliation with the West side of Los Angeles was something at the time when I was growing up that was reserved primarily for the white elite. So when I said, oh, I'm from Santa Monica, people would be very confused because they'd say, what do you mean? Right. I was born there. I lay claim to that pit place. It belongs to me. It is just as much mine and I am just as much belonging to it as anybody else. And so I think that that moment of birth was a scene of instruction in my life that my life my way of thinking my upbringing would not be what you expect and that its purpose would be to completely disrupt whatever the cultural expectations were of the time and i've always felt that that's been who i am and that has been my purpose is to disrupt to culturally question, disrupt, and then rebuild with a newer, fuller, more varied understanding. And I believe that does carry into, you know, the work I'm doing, saying he, him, his, but I'm doing it under protest. I think it comes very much into how and why and for what and, and to what occasion I write and perform for theater is to basically let you understand the world is so much bigger and broader and wider and more colorful and mm -hmm. fabulous yes. <laughs> than these binaries could ever have let you dream it to be. I don't even know where to begin from there. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so, so much to talk about here. Yeah. So with, with, because you you claim those you know you have in your bio black yeah. Irish, Filipino queer gender nonconforming right that's right like let's like back up to those like cultural identities like yeah in terms of your parents like what's that division of cultural identities and like how how do they like influence your your upbringing? well it's it's funny because you know I my mother when I was growing up we used to call her black mama. Um, uh, one of a few things happens to Filipino Americans when they immigrate to the country. Sometimes they assimilate into one or a couple of different pre-established cultural groups. Sometimes they stay to themselves and sometimes they stay nostalgic for the home country. Yeah. Um, I, I, in my case, my mother took very much to the household in which she was unofficially adopted, my dad's family. And part of that was because she felt welcome there. Mm -hmm. Now there's a long lineage of sort of, you know, and, and they're kind of, there are movies I, about this of sort of like 
you know, Filipino Americans sort of identifying more with blacks or Filipino Americans identifying more, you know, all these different, that is what ended up happening in her case is she ended up identifying with this black Southern family that had moved to LA in the forties. But I think the reason why was because she ultimately felt like she was home with these folks because they didn't judge her and because they allowed her to be her unapologetic self. And they gave her a sense of belonging and purpose in this household of my grandmother and two aunts, you know, who had were born and raised in rural Texas, um, came to Los Angeles in the forties during the second great migration and sort of worked their way through LA's black social system to become philanthropists and activists in the civil rights movement. My grandmother, um, was one of the architects of the original Head Start program oh, okay. that, that then was nationalized later on. Yeah. But the pilot for it was done, I, I believe, at Ritter Elementary School, where my grandmother and Mary Lou Tolbert and Rosalie Turner were teaching. I think it was either Ritter or it was Hobart Elementary School. And what they were interested in doing was teaching Black children how to read and write. Mm -hmm. And that was the emphasis of the time. This was the late 50s, early 60s. And, then and that's how Head Start that, began. Well, that's one, that's one, you know, that's one version of how it started. Wow. Was that Mary Lou Tolbert and Doxy Darling Hawes Mason and Rosalie Turner were working at a, a, an urban school trying to figure out how in the hell do we get these children to read? Mm-hmm. And I remember my grandmother telling me stories about these kids coming from homes where they had no food. And they'd say, Miss Mason, Miss Mason, I'm sorry, but I'm so hungry. I ain't had nothing but cold maggettis. Mm -hmm. And she would bring an extra sandwich to give to that kid so that they could have enough food on their brain, as, mm -hmm. as she used to call yeah. it, to learn. Mm -hmm. This is the household that I grew up in. These are the stories that are held within the mind field that I, that influences the work that I do. I can see, I, yeah. You know, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, my aunt was born, my aunt Alma Ethel Hawes Green, she was born in the 1890s. And um, she was the first to move to LA. And then her younger sisters moved afterwards. And the stories that were, that were told about the old days. I, I don't know if I told this one on, on, on the subtext, but my grandmother was studying. I think she was at Prairie View A&M, which was becoming an integrated, um, well, it was an all girls school and they had some, I believe some white professors and they were studying anthropology. And she talked about this crazy man saying, you all are going to learn these anthropological terms if it's the last thing I do. And so they stay there. <laughs> and, then there was a, and then at the end of that same semester, some of the girls flunked. And so she said um, that the uh, headmaster of the school or, or whatever the term was of the time um, said, now, ladies, I have to tell you all, some of you didn't make it. <laughs> some of you didn't make it so you're gonna have to pack your bags and go home but i'm gonna tell you something you're gonna call your mama actually it was right to your mama that's how that's the eight mm -hmm. you're gonna write to your mama you're gonna write to your mama you're gonna write to your mama and tell her that you had vanishing pains and you have to come home <laughs> vanishing pains <laughs> <laughs> you had to vanish from the school. That's why you been trying to give them an out, you know? So that, that kind of fabled, that's the kind of fabled understanding of the world that I'm picking up as a young child. And it's formulating how I tell story. Mm. Now notice how all of this is done orally. And all of this is done in a performative way. So the recent development in my life has been to embrace the performer. When I was growing up, I stood in front of my grandmother's yellow formica table and recited a series of poems from Langston Hughes's um, The Weary Blues and, and uh, Complete Poems. And then I would do Mary McLeod Bethune, Last Will and Testament. 
and wow. then later and then later we added uh Maya Angelou cuz we saw her you know her recitation on uh, on PBS mm. <laughs> so she got added so and I would do these all the time I would do them for the the Phys Art Litmore Club the literary club that my grandmother was a part of the um the organization that that would give scholarships to young to young blacks I'd do it over at the hotel across the street from the Schubert Theater. And I would be carted out as this kind of six, seven, eight-year-old little poet performer. And that's how I really started. So when I say I've been doing this my whole life, I have. I have been doing it as long as I could speak. But somehow along the way, between that six-year-old child, and this is the part of the episode that probably will be germane to the, the, the folks in our audience, is somehow along the way, my performerly self was identified as queer. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, it had to be stopped because it was the gay 90s, you know, mm -hmm. which were actually the most ungay thing. And there was a lot of policing going on in that time a lot of queer policing, including in my household. Mm. And so all of a sudden, I think I took what was originally maybe this, you know, showcase of, of, uh, of, of, of prodigious uh, public speaking. And then it maybe when I was 12 or 13 or a little bit older became uh, a marker of flamboyance. And right. so that's when my dad started taking me out of the shows because he didn't want me to become a sissy ass artist. And I still wanted to be a part of this thing, this performance, this showbiz thing. So I found directing and producing because they were more uh, administrative, so to speak. They were basically more masculine uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. Right. Although I think that playwriting is a very feminized and feminine activity. It's giving birth. You know, but it's in this country, the writers are, 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 you know, the writers are stereotypically seen as a masculinized presence mm -hmm. in the room. We're doing a lot of cultural work to undo that now mm -hmm. by affirming female, trans, non-binary writers and carving space for those folks. Non-Aristotelian writing, you know, not uh, non-linear uh, writing. These are these are ways that we're counterbalancing that previous myth and understanding of playwriting as a man's activity. And I think that's very important work. But in the time when I was growing up, being the director, being the producer, being those were respectable places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was allowed to do. And so that's how I got into the other aspects of the craft. But really all I wanted to do and all I wanted to be was, I just wanted to sing the blues. I just wanted mm -hmm. to be a showgirl. Mm -hmm. I, just want, I just wanted to be a showgirl, you know, and I loved it. And there was an innocence and a freedom and, and a, a lack of filtration and a shamelessness and a lack of apology in that time that I was able to find in myself. And it was taken And I was 18, I went to Princeton, then I came back to Los Angeles because it was the Great Recession, mm. you know, and then that set back a lot of things. And then I went to Northwestern and had to find myself once again. And now, just now, recently, I went back and I started tinkering with who that 12 year old performer was mm. so and i found for her English again theater. good yeah what and was that's that like where the well honey she's the showgirl who writes it down so there's a very different persona and there's there's an aspect of myself that i that i was asked to leave behind mm -hmm. and it was maybe the most pure and happy side of myself and so however many years later you know i can't do math on these ages anymore i'm i just wake up every day it, more than 10 years ago 12 14 years ago whatever i'm 
going to be 34 soon. And, um, but all that time from 18 to now, and to just recently rediscover that 12 year old person. The performative. Has, the performer, the showgirl who writes it down. That's, that's, I realize that's when my work is the most honest. That's when my writing is the most captivating. When I develop it from that perspective. You just because had a reading of the Lavender Men. Yeah. Well, I, I, a lot of things are going on with Lavender Men. So Lavender Men is a queer fantasia on national theme. <laughs> come on, <laughs> come on. Listen, I, 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 I'm grateful for the world that Tony Kushner gave us. I'm picking it up and running with it. And, uh, you know, and so it's a piece about um, Lincoln and his relationship with his legal assistant, Elmer Ellsworth. But the twist Damn is, it. it's narrated by Taffeta. Taffeta is that little showgirl who writes it down. And I play Taffeta. And Taffeta, Taffeta. yes, honey, Taffeta is suffering no fools. <laughs> and so she's out here narrating this story for you. And she's, she's serving you <laughs> daguerreotype realness. <laughs> wow. she's, pulling back, she's pulling back the veils and, yes. and she's letting you see all of these things. And so we had a reading of the show. It started out, um, I, I've been a member of the wonderful uh, Skylight Theaters, a writers in residence program. And um, Skylight is a theater in Los Angeles that has a very storied history here, um, including one of the Red Graves uh, doing some work here in the 80s. And, and at, at, it was an, a, a noted experimental house for a time. And now, is one of the powerhouses and champions for new playwrights that are based in Los Angeles, the new plays and new playwrights. Mm -hmm. So I'm in their writers group. And this play was, was developed within that group. We did a reading of it this past, oh, I don't know what it was. I think it was, it was the summer. All of this happened in the summer. So we did a reading in the summer at Skylight. Very, very, I think the house was very full, what have you, well-received. And after the reading, the artistic director goes, I'm going to do this play. And I said, okay, yes. And so I said, you know, you, 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 don't, you never know when, what, what's going to happen. It's show business. So I go on to New York and Garrett Clayton, fabulous, my dear friend and collaborator, Garrett Clayton, he does the LA reading and then he also does New York. Baby, y'all ready for this tea? Let me tell you what happened when Mother Mason went to New York. <laughs> Child, I'm over here like Francis Gum, also known as Judy Garland. <laughs> Backstage, <laughs> nervous as hell. Couldn't even put on my shoes. Couldn't even put on my shoes. Every five minutes, they're holding us for another five, holding another five. Oh. This room is full. Baby, they're tying my shoe. We're putting this, you know, this little... Uh, calf tan on me i'm making sure that <laughs> the, the the folds are out of it and i'm running out on this stage shoe half done saying well bitch whatever it is it's gonna be and i walk out there baby do you know that was a sold out reading on broadway at circle in the square mm -hmm. i believe you honey well you can check the, you can so check the playbill well on steve too <laughs> oh my good oh, hi. did people like it? i don't know how how it's been received i just know that the people were there mm -hmm. and they loved it yeah were you there i was not there i've read reviews doing research about your work read the review their review oh i, I didn't know it was reviewed wow no. Okay, well, good. I'm glad. You might have to tell me what they, you might have to send me some of those. <laughs> I will. I'll send them to they, you. They were reviews of Lavender Men? Yes. Really? I really mm -hmm. like that you weren't aware of that and don't really like. You need to Google air. yourself. I mean, you, I, I'm going to let you send that stuff to me. I, I will. You know, I try not to Google myself yeah. because, you know, I'm working. I, I'm not, I, I, I'm out here. You got to keep I, it moving. I, I, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm just another gigging artist. You know, yeah. I'm out here. I'm out here working the circuit yeah. and, and trying to get this stuff moving. But I, I don't try and Google this stuff because you would go crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you go down that rabbit hole and you read in the trades. Oh, this award came out. That one. I, I can't waste my time on that. 
Yeah, I you used should. to tell me about I, I it. Used, I used to waste <laughs> my time on it. I used to waste a lot of time on it. And then I realized that was two hours that I could have sat down and taken those notes from that dramaturg and actually just made mm. the changes that would get me that award next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hello. So you just have to really redistribute these energies and figure out what are you spending time on and what are you investing in and how are you using this mental energy towards your advantage? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. that is what, because this is a, this is a, this is a dog eat dog business. If you let it be, it can also, it can also be a tremendous playground and community building experience. I mean, yeah. have you heard of um, the National New Play Network? I have heard of okay. NNPN. Yes. I did their branding like five oh, years ago. Yeah. Wow, fabulous. Yeah, their visual branding. Um, but yeah, and like we've talked to a couple people like Justin Zayer just about the the sort of um, the growing um, theater community in L.A. that yeah. wasn't as much there back in the day. Now, um, honey, Miss Miss Justin is fierce. Honey. I, I just uh, I just do you saw know David. I, I no, I have brushed past the yeah. tassels of Justin's uh, oh, yes. caftans. Fresh caftans, yes. Uh, a, a, a couple of times. And um, I did an interview on Better Lemons. Uh, it was an email interview for, for a show that, that Justin did out here called Ravenswood that yes, I thought was we saw excellent. That. We Ravenswood, saw that in New York. Yes, that was very, very well executed high camp. Yes. And I, and I want Justin to know that I have tremendous respect. I, I walked out of the episode that I saw looking quite, quite proud at the craftsmanship of, of that, it was excellent, very well. He is keeping a tradition alive mm-hmm. that, that has been a, a, really a safe haven for queer artists for so long. Mm-hmm. For so long, that's the only way we could get on stage was to do camp. Yes. And that was also, right. it was a defense mechanism and a, a way of survival. You know? Anyone that needs to know what camp is can do, look at any of Justin's body of work. <laughs> right. Camp is not easy. Camp is no. very scientific. Mm-hmm. The camp is a very, very, very mathematical um, procedure it, that, that's, it, that, that, that entails creating that, those jokes and that, and, and the way that he has created a lineage in that show of all the different, um, all of the different people. And I mean, I, mm-hmm. he's, he's got a, a, a hell of a mind. I, 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 let me just keep doing this three pander about Lincoln. I, <laughs> sure. he, he can, he can do that. Hey, Justin, baby, I, I, I tip my hat to you on that one. But, um, but yeah, Lavender Men. So what's going on with it now? And, and I'm saying this because we have a platform and a forum um, now for this. But what's going on with it now is um, Los Angeles Skylight has been brave and generous and prescient enough to decide to produce the world premiere of the play here in Los Angeles. Great. So now, right. So now what we're doing is we're looking to see who else can get on board. So queer programmers, whether you work for queer theaters or you work for large institutions that may include queer work or those that are just national in nature, Lavender Med is available. <laughs> for production <Pitch> it. <laughs> it is available for production it is a three-hander uh, the the show open there's a blank stage so i don't see your overhead being that much darling i think you just need to go ahead and do it because it's a fun ride and it's a, and it's a and it's a great evening of theater that uh, what the, the the bit of feedback that i have gotten about the piece is how undeniably theatrical it is. It's something that is genuinely written for the stage. Mm-hmm. And I take that as a high compliment because, you know, I think you have to really use and, and, and exist within and, and expand past the, um, the limitations of the, the medium that you're using. And what, else, so, what other stuff do you have going on now? 
So Lavender Men is going on. Um, I have a play called Burns in Their Veins, which is a piece about Pio Pico, who was California's last Mexican governor before America took it over. And what he tried to do was do some tax evasion um, in the burgeoning days of of American California so he could become a uh, real estate mogul of the time. And I have a piece about him uh, being basically shown that the new world was not, did not have the same place for folks like him. So it's sort of a piece, uh, he, he, he learns what it means to be an immigrant in that, in that story and what it means to be the other. And, um, but it's very much about ambition and, and, what, and what it feels like to reach for something much like Icarus and then be shot out from the sky. Mm-hmm. So that, that, so that piece, it's an epic theater piece that I'm doing a reading of in January here in LA. And then my ongoing um, story is this 1920s drag piece that's called Pleasure Men. Oh, I see the smile on, on, yes. on Jill. Yeah. Honey, I've been wanting to, I've been wanting to, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I, I read about the, this drag uh, burlesque musical and I, I, I want all the information on this. What now, what, <laughs> what did amazing. you read? What did you read about it? It was very simple. It was, it was simply that it was just about um, a music about Mae West life um, through drag burlesque, which immediately grabbed my attention. And I was like, I am down for this. So let me just, so let me clarify. Don't believe everything you read because don't believe, what, the hype, mi, mi, don't believe the hype, you know, hype up the <laughs> truth. So here's the thing that's going on with that piece. So it, it's called pleasure men and it was, um, it was first developed. Well, really it was first developed with a group called fresh ground pepper, uh, which has mm-hmm. a retreat. Yes. Look those folks up. Fresh Ground Pepper NYC. They have a summer retreat every year. And um, I did it a couple of years ago. And I got a lot out of that that writer's community. Then from there, Hook and Eye Theater took a risk on me and brought me in to do a residency at the Flea with them. So then it, it did that. Now, there is going to be a presentation of the play in the summer that I can't talk about yet. But in January or so, there will be some announcements or January or February, I'll be able to talk more about that. And is this in New York or LA? That, that will be in Los Angeles. Cool. Now, what, now, there's a New York component to this as well. Because what I'm trying to do is work with one of the first companies that, that helped bring me out to New York um, called the Fire This Time Festival. And I think what we're trying to do is work on a reading or presentation of the play um, probably in the fall um, in New York. So don't worry, New York City, it'll be coming to you. But let me just tell you what the play is about and what it's not about. So what, it, what it's not about is Mae West life. Okay. What it is about is these five queens that, that I made up who were in the back row of the drag number in her show, The Pleasure Man, which was raided by the police in 1928. Wow. And all these queens, all 50 of them were paraded out on Broadway and outed, you know, so jobs, lives, reputations ruined. Hmm. Um, and this play is about the five in the back because I'm so fascinated by the girls in the back of the room. You know, the big drag queens of the time, you know, are, are written about more. But what happens to those underdogs? What happens to the, <laughs> the girls whose act is not quite as fierce yeah. and they're just in the kick line in the back? Their lives are affected by gender policing, by, you know, by prejudice and bias too. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I wrote a piece that allowed me to look at a couple of different, maybe archetypical um, identities. So I have an older queen because I want to talk a a little bit about um, ageism within our community. I have a queen that um, I have, I have a a queen from Harlem because I want to talk about race and representation. I have a queen that 
I have, we talk about transgenderism in the piece, but from a 20s perspective, um, so on and so forth. So within this, this cadre of, of girls, we're able to really look at a wide array of, 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 of part of our experience and see how they fared in, in the process of being out and what, what the dream was in the beginning mm -hmm. of the play. You know, here I am about to debut my piece on Broadway. And then all of a sudden, it's squelched pretty immediately by the arrest and all that. And then what does it mean to wait? You know, so, this, so then we go to jail with them and it's a whole, you know, it's a whole thing. And, and it's very interesting to see. How, every time I sit down with that play, I'm just brimming with ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm just brimming with ideas because it's so exciting to me. There's just something about going into that world and spending some time with those queens that in the back. In yeah, the there's back. so much potential there. There's so yeah. much, I mean, it's just so exciting. Untold stories. It's all about untold stories. And I think that's why it appeals to me. There is, there is music. There is a, a play with music aspect to it. Um, and that's primarily, that's primarily what was written about probably in the article that you saw is um, there, there's a performance element in the first act that, that ends the first act. And that's probably what people picked up on. Well, it sounds fabulous. I can't wait to see it. Well, I, we are going to have to get you out for this reading. And well, I'm in LA Hi. quite often. I have a project in Santa Monica. Actually. He is, and I just invited myself again with yeah, him. Yeah, she'll, she'll there come. There you with go. Me. Well, yes. there you go, y'all. So yes. that that's what that that's a lot of what I'm doing right now. Um, there's some film and TV stuff in the works, but you know we we yeah. don't talk about those. We don't you talk about those. those. Okay. We don't talk about those yet. But we will be able to soon. But Not that's exciting because that's something that um, Justin Sayer does as well. Out mm -hmm. there is, you know, right, right. shows. Yeah. Well, I will say this. I, um, my short film, I can talk about this. My short film, Softer, mm. debuted at Outshine a few months ago. Tell us what Outshine Congrats. is first. Yeah. So Outshine is Outshine is an LGBTQ film festival in Florida. Great. Okay. And so we debuted the film in Florida. It, it was a very interesting experience because it's been a long road with that film for me. I, 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 and I'm still trying to understand what it is. Uh, you know, it's hard to, pr I found that it's harder for folks to program historical work because it almost, be within the short film genre, it almost becomes its own genre that, mm. that hasn't quite been created yet. Interesting. Yeah. There's also, the other thing that I noticed when I was developing, um, uh, you know, sort of shopping this film around is that this is the, the short film market, particularly in the indie world and especially in the queer world, is very much about the writer performers. I noticed that the films that seem to do the best are the ones that are more directly and explicitly autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Because they're able to hit a particular kind of heartstring in a specific way mm -hmm. that's very immediate. Mm -hmm. I think in short films, you have a very finite window of time to grab people and the modality of argumentation that you have to use is pathos. If you don't get them from that emotional place very early on, that short film is not necessarily going to have the same kind of immediate, re people will respect the work. People will come to you from a place of, of, of tremendous respect. And that's been the case with this film. But in terms of like Grand Prix and the, the stuff, the films I'm noticing, and this is just my own observation, just being more actively involved this year, the stuff that, te that, sent, that seems to fare very well is these very personal, contemporary, you know, writer performer. There's something fledging and entrepreneurial about that work. So when you have a piece that takes on very difficult national themes like queerness in the Civil War and, and power and slavery, it's a lot for folks to digest in a 10-minute period. Yeah. 
and you're asking of them a lot. And I think what it really speaks to is the fact that we still need to develop better and more immediately available language around bias and its legacy and its mm -hmm. history. I think we still are struggling with how to talk about race and sexuality in this country. Oh, yeah. And so if softer has been able to make some folks squirm in their seats while they're scre screening this thing, deciding whether it gets in or doesn't, if softer has been able to make someone want to go to the bathroom a little bit early in a theater, I'm grateful because I believe I have done the job of the piece. I believe I have done the public service that that work called me to do, which is to make you all uncomfortable <sighs> Did so you... that we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. Did you, so you wrote it, were you also in it? The writer performer role. No, I no, I wasn't in that one. Okay, <laughs> I can't wait. I to wasn't. See in, it. I was. I was not. I was not in that one. No, this piece was. Um, it was. Well, you know, every hands in a, in in a, it felt. Now this is where it's different. Somewhat is you know, you're the writer, but baby, you're getting stuff from everywhere, and mm -hmm. and we're just curating. So, but I I wrote the piece. It was directed by my very dear friend and collaborator Lovell Holder who's out here in Los Angeles as well. And um, it was also, it was produced with Robert Ulrich and, and, and Mike Jenner, who, who work with a company, their company is called Stay Relevant Productions. Cool. And I had, a, and we're very close with Robert. And I got a chance to meet Mike finally during uh, Outshine because he lives in Miami. So he came down to Fort Lauderdale to see the movie. And we just kicked it like there was no tomorrow. I mean, Mike is the bomb, y'all. Like, Mike <laughs> is fabulous. <laughs> Tell us what a day in your, in, in your life is like, like writing. Mm. Do, you, do you have like a routine down? One of the most important things that I did was to join the hatchery. So I, it's a writer's co-op in Los Angeles, and this is slightly an advertisement for them. It's a co-op of writers in LA, and it is absolutely a fantastic place to work. So I'll spend many, many hours there. Um, I'm up usually between five and six in the morning plotting what the hell's going on, because there's much to plot. Sometimes there'll be phone calls to New York or what have you between like eight and nine. And then I'll usually write for a long period of time. But it's, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, it's a lot of admin in the mornings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you're, when you're an, an entrepreneur, <laughs> we'll just <laughs> coin that one today. When you're an entrepreneur, honey, uh, you, you are your own CEO, CFO, director of communications, everything. So I really tend to do my writing for theater or TV film. I primarily do that, I call it when the world is still. Mm -hmm. So it's usually like dusk. Now, I can't really go past 10 p.m. like I used to. Yeah. Same. <laughs> Babe, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Me too. I'm absolutely. Do you write also? No, I'm an interior architect, and Renessa is a graphic designer. Uh, Fabulous. Marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I might be editing the podcast episodes after 10 p.m., but <laughs> I can't do. Yeah. But you know what? Brain is what, like. Well, what, mental energy is exhausting, and the thing yeah. about it that we the, the thing about it that we have to recognize and realize and remember is. We spend so, if you're really invested in your creative endeavor, we spend so, so much time mm -hmm. just developing that work that yeah. by the time you get to 10 p.m., you're just exhausted. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely exhausted. I'm in bed every night by 9.30. <laughs> okay, not, not, honey, don't tell nobody that. They don't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> unless you unless you unless you're advertising <laughs> she's available at 9 31 you know she where to in, find me <laughs> she was in bed at 9 30 yeah i've heard some people say 
you know, creative professionals that to do the most important work priority early in the morning because you're you're fresh and then there's like there's also the argument for doing getting the admin stuff out of the way so that you have the rest of the day and I don't let know me tell like you whatever me, works for you yeah let me tell you what my let me tell you what um my producer and and very close friend of of many many years told me uh, uh, recently she said you need to wake up and do three things that'll make you some money first totally. yes. yeah then, <laughs> then figure out the rest right <laughs> so, rest so the first so the first thing on the agenda it, you know, is let, let me call, let me call folks in New York. Let me get that done. And then l- let me see what writing, you know, writing coaching or clients or whatever other, you know, gigs can be confirmed. Mm-hmm. Then now who emailed me? What is this? Okay. You know, then you go, you go through the priority list from there. Yeah. But the first thing you got to do is figure out how am I going to pay these bills? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I do. Things. I do all of my billable hours first and get that out of the way. And uh, then I do my admin and then that usually exhausts me and uh, frustrates me. And then my Uh, day is over. And then, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Got to find what works for you. I mean, that's pretty much it. But I, yeah, I definitely believe in like finding a community of people to, to work with because so much of our work is solitary. Um, you know, so those kinds of like retreats and residencies and um, just co- co-working spaces, collaborative spaces. Um, did you find, so you have a BA, an MA and an MFA? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you find like, I mean, obviously you honed your craft during those years, but you said that like Taffeta didn't sort of get reborn and come to life until recent recently so after like academia i mean in other words like was it do you are you glad that you went to school for all those years i what this is what i say about that i think going to princeton taught me that i am my own best product Mm. to sell at least in the time when I was at Princeton, you had to sell yourself to get anything. You had to re-interview to get into certain elite classes. You had to know people in order to get into certain groups. So it made you very, very socially sophisticated and very politically nimble. That's what I learned from Princeton. Wow. From Middlebury College, I learned the beauty of the woods meaning not only the physical woods where the campus is in Ripton, Vermont, but also the woods of our mind. What does it mean to get lost with no particular agenda in mind other than the pure joy of learning? Mm. What does it mean to get lost in the woods in your mind? And from Northwestern, I learned what the value of an artistic community is Mm. because in order to survive the cold, we had to form an artistic community. Now notice none of the things I learned were necessarily academic in nature, but all of them were necessary for my survival as an artist. So therefore Mm. I think that I, but see, that's just me though. Right. I'm looking every moment is a teachable moment. And so I'm looking for what can I learn? What can I gain? What can be gleaned from this experience? Always. That's just how I am. Now, what what, Taffeta came from me two years out after having graduated from, um, from this program at Northwestern and saying, all right, we've been applying the same old way to stuff. What's missing? The funk. Well, I know where the funk is. The funk is in my hips. The, at the bottom of my abdomen. In my perineum. That's where the funk is. Sacral chakra. That's right. <laughs> I had to go back to the root. So I think two years in the world was about returning to the root returning to that scene, that moment where I was told, don't be a sissy-ass artist. 
And I went back to that place and I said, I not only am going to be a sissy ass artist, I'm going to be the most fabulous sissy ass artist with the most clarion bell sounding voice. You ain't going and you ain't going to be able to shut me up. <laughs> I will be, you will hear me holler. And that, so that lack of apology, that sense of shamelessness and joy, that's what I think the last two years taught me. Yeah. It sounds well, like you, yeah. you took a lot of valuable things from those, <clears throat> those academic experiences. But like you said, you, you, took those from that you mm. sought them out and you made those experiences what they were anyone can go to princeton and like anybody can go anywhere it's not yeah. where you go it's what you do with exactly. it exactly and, and and i say because uh, i do uh, essay coaching and tutoring uh, and and i say to folks listen it's not about getting into college it's not about getting out of college yep. it's about getting over it yeah <laughs> How do I get over it? It's perfect. <laughs> well, it's undeniable that you have the gift of storytelling. You're, you're, um, you get the sense of of sitting around a campfire listening to you. You know, um, I I have always loved and honored the power that a story can hold. Stories are transformative, and they are transportative. I think that's a word. And if it's not in Shakespeare's name, it will be today, <laughs> you know, but I think stories have the ability to take you to places, physical and metaphysical. If you just open your mind, your heart and your root to accept them. And I think that that really ultimately is my mission. My mission is to help people get past the biases that have plagued them so that they can open their hearts, minds, spirits, and perineums to receive other stories, even the stories that they were told they shouldn't hear or didn't happen. Maybe they did happen and you're going to be all right. Yeah. I see a whole like creative coach side gig here. <laughs> well, we, we know you I'm can do the logo you. for it. <laughs> you know, you can get the logo for it. Yeah. <laughs> we well, have a, um, yeah. we're wrapping up on an hour here, but we you have a, you have a, a rehearsal. To go. I do. The, yeah. the, the legendary children are at the door. We're actually in oh, the, the children. The, yes, honey. The legendary children. Every show I'm on, I have my, my, my gift, my gift of creatives mm -hmm. and I call them the legendary children. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing because we're rehearsing softer because actually we're going up in two days. Wow. So we're actually, right. So we're going up at Summit, Son of Semele Theater here in Los Angeles. So I'm doing a little catch up on some tech that we decided last night. And, um, and so that's what we're doing here. But yes, you were saying. Well, we have a wonderful tradition of, um, you know, a lot of our listeners are younger queer creatives. Is yes. there any advice that you would like to give our listeners? First of all, I want to say to the young queer listeners, you all saved my life because I learned from them how to be this brave. The young generation, the new generation of queer people, they are some of the bravest and wisest souls on this planet because they are not held down by any of the things that plagued us old fogies growing up in the times before. So I guess what advice I would give them is really not advice at all, but really a, a, give, a, a, a statement of thanks. I want to thank you all for reminding us that we are free if we allow ourselves to be. Oh, I love that. Keep doing what you're doing, young queer creatives. Yeah. Keep good. Keep doing. That's what I would say. Keep doing what you're doing because I know that one day soon we will live in a world that is without all of these barriers. And it's just a matter of the persistence of a generation to demand that that be true. These yeah. children are demanding that they be seen, heard, 
respected and regarded with the highest esteem because they are the next evolution of human being. They are existing outside of socialized bias. I love it. They are superhuman. And I am so grateful and so thankful and so excited to be in the world with them. I cannot wait to watch these folks grow up and become the leaders and the, and the, and the thought innovators that I know they already are. Mm-hmm. So, so, for, so that, that's what I say to thank them. Thank you. Yeah. Bless well, you all. And thank you. Well, we can't wait to see all the work <laughs> that you continue to do. Thank you. In the world. Thank, thank you, you for your much. time, Roger. You've been wonderful. Oh. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. I will, and, and, and Jonah, honey, I need this lavender mint tea, so I'm going to email oh, you. Oh, I'm going to send that to you for sure. I'm also going to reach out to you to get the dates for um, the next time I'm in um, Los Angeles. So we'll, we'll get it all together. Yeah. We'll get yes. it all together. All right. Well, thank you we all so you, much. We love you, Roger. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you like what you heard, or even if you didn't, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. And follow us on Twitter at Creative Queer and Instagram at The Queer Creative Podcast. And you can now watch a video of this episode on our new YouTube page titled The Queer Creative Podcast. Visit our website, thequeercreative.com and submit your work to be featured or send it to us in direct messages on social media. Thanks, queers. Bye.